If you ask me today, had I thought I would be in the public service in this particular role, I wouldn't have not really imagined uh, that being the case. So I, as a policy institution, we, we are coordinating a, a large sector. We work with all sectors. So whether it's health, whether it's education, agriculture. It sounds like you guys have been very busy. We cannot talk about innovation, entrepreneurship for young people without creating access to market. You may actually start generating revenue as you offer certain services. Innovation uh, is not easy. Entrepreneurship is not easy. We hope we can find those. All right, Eve, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. So you are the permanent secretary at the Ministry of ICT and Innovation here in Rwanda. And before we get into exactly what uh, you do at the ministry, I would like to first understand your context. Who is Eve? How did you get started with your career? But also specifically, how did you get started with technology? Thank you. Well, it's an interesting journey. Um, I think if you ask me today, had I thought I would be in the public service in this particular role as permanent secretary, the Minister of ICT Innovation, I wouldn't have not really imagined uh, that being the case. So I went to school. I did uh, my uh, bachelor's in computer science and mathematics. Uh, but interestingly enough, my first job deviated me slightly from that background. Uh, my first role was a career advisor. I, uh, my immediate um, uh, group I was working with is a Bridge to Rwanda Scholars Program, um, where we prepared people to go and study abroad. And so my specific role was to uh, help them build um, an understanding of the industries and make a decision on what they wanted to choose to study once they go uh, to the university, mostly North America, um, uh, the United States of America, as well as Canada, but a few of them in Europe. So helping them to decide uh, what they wanted to pursue. But the second most important part was to create pathways that allow them to launch their careers. So that would start typically with a community service before they go to university, internships during the university um, uh, uh, journey, and then upon graduation, helping them land their first job. And so there was nothing, uh, I would say, the university would have prepared me for that role, but it was very interesting because I got to be exposed to how to develop talent uh, from a young age, uh, how to guide young people as they pursue their careers, but also most importantly, how to understand the industry and figure out what are the opportunities that uh, would be most relevant for a university graduate and particularly a globally uh, competitive and globally educated um, uh, talent, which was very interesting. So that I did for about four years and um I uh, moved to an organization that was doing uh, architecture design and engineering services. And that also exposed me to a whole other uh, aspect of uh, uh, industry, uh, particularly when it comes to developing capital projects, uh, working with uh, global clients. And, and there I focused on operations, uh, really coordinating um, a multi-office organization uh, working across uh, two different continents. So that allowed me also to understand a bit of around operational logistics, people management, and, and coordination. So those are roles that I feel like early on shaped um, my career um, and, and, and it led to uh, really identifying myself as a leader um, by, you know, growing in those roles. But prior to these two, all in parallel, I've always had um, an interest in entrepreneurship. So I, um, uh, even early on as a student, get involved in entrepreneurial activities, organizing business plan competitions, uh, different events for, for youth, highlighting young innovators has always been a passion of mine. And um, I'm excited that today in my current capacity, I get to do, to do a little bit about, you know, supporting innovators, uh, talking about entrepreneurship as well. Interesting background, um, working from education to architecture, entrepreneurship, and now finding yourself in the public sector space. Um, I think what we would love to understand is um, a bit about the Ministry of ICT and Innovation. What is the mandate of the ministry and what was it set up to do? 
No, thank you. Uh, the Ministry of ICT Innovation is a very uh, one of the new ministries in terms of uh, uh, its journey. Before it was ICT and youth combined, and that those portfolio was separated uh, to focus on uh, ICT, and later on innovation was added on our mandate. So the the mission, the core mission of our work is to um, promote and coordinate policies and programs that are focusing on a digital transformation of the country. Um, uh, digital technologies uh, are key in our socioeconomic development as a country. Uh, we think of technologies as an enabler to uh, a holistic uh, development uh, and transformation of the country. So we are mandated to look at programs, policies that will enable uh, the whole of, of, of the country uh, to make the progress and the transformation we, we need to do. So as a policy institution, we, we are coordinating a, a large sector that has implementing agencies, uh, one of them being the Rwanda Information Society Authority, which implements um, uh, IT infrastructure systems primarily for the government, but also leading the way on how the private sector can uh, access these technologies. We have the National uh, Identity Authority, uh, which is currently busy developing the digital ID uh, for, for the country. We have the post office, uh, uh, which is, is also very key in terms of uh, driving e-commerce, among, among other services that we want to improve and, and provide for the citizens. But we work very closely with other institutions. Uh, we have a center for the fourth industrial revolution, which has been very key in uh, developing and, and now operationalizing uh, the artificial intelligence policy that we, we, we passed as a country and looking at different use cases that we can implement in, in, uh, on AI. Um, we also work uh, very closely with uh, the Rwanda Development Board, particularly when it comes to innovation and entrepreneurship uh, work that, that, that we do, uh, and looking at investments going into the ICT sector. Um, of course, we also work with uh, 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 RURA, which is the regulator uh, of um, uh, multi-regulator, but they also regulate the ICTs. And so when it comes to enabling the, the ecosystem, the private sector, uh, setting up you know, the, the ethical guidelines, for instance, for AI and, and many other aspects, we work very closely with the regulator. There are two other key institutions that, that are recent, uh, the Rwanda Space uh, Agency, um, but also the National Cybersecurity Authority. These are also institutions we work very closely with when it comes to developing different capabilities, uh, particularly on, on, on protecting the cyberspace. Um, we, we recently had a data privacy and protection law that was passed that um, was now, is, is now uh, enacted. And um, the, the Cybersecurity Authority has a data protection office to make sure that uh, uh, both government institutions, private sector can comply with the provisions of the law. Uh, so cybersecurity authorities is really key, but space is really bringing on a lot of capabilities using satellite imageries and being able to um, support when it comes to planning for uh, urban, urbanization, urban development, uh, planning for agriculture and many other uh, priorities they're looking at, including mitigating the risks of disasters, among, among other things. So. From that point of view, we, we have a broad ecosystem of institutions and priorities that are geared towards uh, that element on leveraging technologies to uh, achieve an economic transformation for the country. Uh, the, lastly, I would say we work with all sectors. So whether it's health, whether it's education, agriculture, we are looking at how can we uh, leverage the emerging technologies to achieve the transformation in those respective sectors as well. It sounds like you guys have been very busy. It's fun. It's, uh, we get to we get to tap into different topics, different work, and yeah. also collaborate with many institutions across the government and the private sector. Um, I think Rwanda is known now on the African continent as being at the forefront of promoting technology and ICT in every single sector of the country. And I've always been curious, and I know a lot of people who are listening are very curious about this. Why this huge focus on technology? I think part of our vision 2050, when you look at um, what Rwanda is uh, betting on to achieve uh, upper middle income uh, status as a country, is really a knowledge-based economy. 
And, and I think through technology, we can enable our citizen to acquire the, 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 the skills uh, to tap into uh, the power of a global market. Um, we are a landlocked uh, country, um, so we are very limited when it comes to developing some sectors such as manufacturing due to the cost of logistics. Uh, when you think about um, our economy, it, it, it's small. Uh, uh, it's close to 14 million people. Uh, but um, uh, when you think about what technology can do to link us to the region, um, for instance, the power of uh, uh, e-commerce and being able to uh, export within the region. That is the leverage that technology can have in terms of high-end uh, value uh, kind of services and products that we can provide. So when you think about our competitive advantage is, is actually enabled um, and empowered by uh, embracing technology because we can be able to compete um, despite those limitations that I mentioned. So I think our leadership understands um, uh, those opportunities. And I think you can tell from the last 20 years, different investments going into infrastructure capabilities, laying out the fiber uh, connectivity and broadband across the country, having a very conducive environment for telecom uh, and uh, operators and ISPs to, 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 to be in the country. Uh, among many other uh, investments are coming up, uh, both on the private sector side, but also in the government. When we have, you know, uh, companies like Kirembo putting all the services for the citizen on, on a single portal, uh, working, you know, hand in hand with different uh, organizations to digitize their services. When you think about um, um, uh, really this citizen-centered uh, um, approach to governance, technology, is an enabler and it plays a, a critical role to empower our citizens. So I think it, it's always been part of that vision of, of achieving the economic transformation, but also enabling Rwandans to compete globally. Very interesting. Um, can you tell me a little bit about some of the projects or the major projects that you guys are working on, um, especially promoting entrepreneurship and in terms of building pipelines of entrepreneurs, but also just supporting them in their growth? Right. So uh, at the ministry, we have a strong focus on innovation and entrepreneurship. Uh, in fact, we, we think that for technology to play that critical part of an enabler, we need to make sure that um, both from skills, but also from solutions, the type of solutions that we are encouraging our innovators to pursue are solutions that, yes, are tackling our challenges, uh, but also they are scalable and that are globally relevant and, and competitive that we can then be able to tap into other markets. So we've been piloting both from a point of view of policies um, and strategies, uh, but also putting in place real programs that are directly impacting entrepreneurs. Maybe let me start with from policies. Um, we have uh, uh, recently adopted the public procurement for innovation, which is... Um, uh, a concept of procurement that has been now adopted in, in our national procurement law, essentially it's allowing uh, government entities to procure uh, innovative uh, solutions from young startups, which is previously typically not possible for, for government to be able to spend uh, public funds on, uh, let's say, um, uh, uh, new and not tested, not globally scaled, products or services. So we're creating this principle of procurement uh, and we'll come back to it because we believe um, we can then create a pathway for young entrepreneurs, startups to tap into our public procurement. The second thing we've been also uh, working on is a startup act, which creates um, a set of incentives and um, uh, programs uh, for young startups to be able to start operations and, 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 and eventually become competitive in, in, in the market. Uh, and these incentives are, you know, can be, you know, tax related incentives, but more importantly, to enable them to invest and reinvest uh, their revenue into developing their services. Um, we've also have been looking at other policies, including the AI policy, uh, the data protection law. We're working with other government institutions, particularly the Ministry of uh, 
trade and commerce, on uh, intellectual property elements. These are things that enable uh, the, the policy frameworks that enable uh, startups and, 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 and young entrepreneurs to find a conducive environment. Um, and so those, those are maybe in terms of enabling uh, framework and uh, uh, policies and, and, and strategies. But when it comes to actually our projects, we, we have a number of them. Uh, one, we are um, investing in making sure that there are support uh, from both government, but also entrepreneur support organizations towards the ventures that we have in our ecosystem. What we noticed in the past is that there are multiple ESOs that are giving different services, and it can be challenging for uh, startups and for entrepreneurs, especially the founders, to navigate where to get the best support and the most customer support. Um, and so when you have an ecosystem of more than 60 ESOs, it can be quite uh, challenging. So uh, we've seen you know, some companies, or startups moving from one ESO to another, but recently, we are calibrating this approach of uh, performance-based uh, grants uh, through a project being implemented by our uh, agency, RISA, to make sure that there are, there's KPIs when it comes to how ESOs move a startup or a founder from one level to another. And that kind of performance is going to be recognized and rewarded through a grant mechanism that the ministry uh, is able to, to provide. And we believe this is a program that will ensure that um, uh, those who are venturing into solving the challenges that we have, uh, especially innovative solutions that are leveraging technologies, we can be able to support them. We'll also have a mechanism to go straight uh, directly to the support of, of our startups themselves in addition to ESOs. So that's one of the program. We run uh, a, a national competition called Hunger Pitch Fest. The idea is that we recognize some of the startups uh, young, you know, trying to really uh, penetrate the market. And so when we do Hunger Pitch first, we want to identify them as early as uh, at ideation level, at incubation level, to create um, a program where they get, you know, support through boot camps um, and preparation uh, in terms of their, uh, you know, fine-tuning uh, their pitch, fine-tuning their uh, branding where necessary, fine-tuning their business plans. And, of course, we are able to award a few of them. Uh, top five uh, uh, get to present on a national stage and, and work away with cash prizes. But about top 45 actually receive uh, non-cash uh, um, support uh, through incubation programming in partnership with uh partners in the ecosystem, ESOs in particular. So that's another program. Um, what we want to be able to do is to create a more vibrant, streamlined, uh, really optimized ecosystem that where both government, the ministry, uh, or other organizations that are supporting innovation um, to be able to identify the most effective way to invest in these startups. So we, we have those programs and we think uh, through you know um, multiple iterations that we do and in partnerships, we're able to be a bit more effective on how we move startups towards uh, growing in this market and scaling uh, both regionally and globally. Yeah. I'm very curious, from a government standpoint, do you guys have a very clear differentiation between an SME and a startup? Because I believe that uh, both of them are essential for the economy, but then they require different types of support. So I'm just wondering, are you guys thinking about, um, you know, what are the differences between these two and how you can actually create programs that are tailored for these um, different types of companies? No, absolutely. And that's a very relevant question you ask, because sometimes, as I mentioned, the support towards this, the startup might not be exactly what is needed if you're not defining clearly uh, whether it's government, whether ESOs, what, what is it exactly that you provide to, to these organizations and the founders and, and the teams that are behind them? So yes, we, we do take that into consideration, uh, particularly when we look at um, the Startup Act. It's really understanding what, what, what the, the state of a startup and then being able to tailor the different incentives that allow them to launch and to succeed at early stage. 
Um, we also recognize that for the broader ecosystem success, we need to have programs that accompany these individuals or startups from uh, early ideation level uh, stage all the way to when they need when to scale up. So that's why you find we have a startup fund, which is provided for by the, our investment court. But we also have funds such as the Rwanda Innovation Fund, which is looking at primarily uh, startups or, or companies that are ready to scale. Uh, and so we have those different instruments that can invest at different levels. Uh, but again, we're not doing this alone. We, we have an ecosystem that is vibrant, different programs um, by partners where we're able to tap into that support. And, and as I mentioned, the tools we have now at the ministry uh, for ESOs, entrepreneur support organizations and, and, and ventures, are tools that are able to actually maintain a certain KPI on these organization individually so that we can be able to know where are our companies in the ecosystem and what, how can we support them. And when we come back to the public procurement for innovation, we also want to make sure that we are opening up the public uh, tenders to these organizations so that at different levels they can bid and win um, government uh, tenders, which is critical for them to access the market that they need to you know, provide their, their services and their products. And that's a very good segue into my next question, which is around the public procurement for innovation project that you guys are working on. I think for us as founders uh, working in a country like Rwanda, we see we as entrepreneurs and innovators, we know and we have the ability to be able to build solutions uh, that ministries could use, different companies or even the government itself could use to optimize and digitize various different services. However, it's always been very hard to be able to land some of these government tenders, right? Because uh, number one, you know, the criteria is most of the startups or SMEs cannot even meet some of them. So I'm just wondering uh, if you could walk us through um, what is this project and how are you guys thinking about involving us as entrepreneurs into this? Right. No, thank you. This is a very good question. One that really, I guess, keep us awake at the ministry, uh, trying to create opportunities for startups. Because on one side, we cannot talk about innovation, entrepreneurship for young people without creating access to markets. So when you think about government and the role of government, it's more than just setting the policies. It's actually as one of the biggest uh, economy driver for in terms of expenditure, we want to make sure that um, we can actually attract, you know, SMEs, startup companies, innovative solutions that we need to, to, to provide better services as government. So um, that's where public procurement for innovation comes in. Because when you look at the significance of uh, government expenditures globally, it's north on average, north of uh, 12% of the GDPs. But particularly for Rwanda, if you pick an example of uh, fiscal year or financial year, um, uh, 2018 and uh, to 2019, more than 24.9% uh, of the budget um, of the GDP was was uh, was through uh, public procurement. So that's very significant. We're talking about uh, close to 604 billion Rwandan francs uh, spent through uh, procuring goods and services uh, to, to for the government. So when we think about the significance of that percentage, uh, we want to make sure that these same startups, these same SMEs and, 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 and relatively young organizations in terms of track record have access to, 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 to this particular market. And so the public procurement for innovation is something we've been testing uh, since uh, 2021, I believe. And we went through a lot of iterations. Um, we're able to demonstrate the benefits of uh, using th this method of procurement. And now it has been adopted into our national procurement law uh, to enable all government entities to use uh, the, this, this method. And let me talk a little bit about it. Typically, uh, to procure uh, goods and services in government, you have to have clarity and a good definition of what you need. Uh, if it's a specific product, you write terms of reference that not only specify the product that you need, but uh, but also the kind of organization that is eligible 
provide you that product because, again, you are using public funds, and so you want to make sure that the value of money is at the highest. So you minimize any risks, any surprises of not getting the best quality product for the most um, less money. Uh, and, and so that's why the terms of reference in the tendering pro process already exclude anyone who may have the labor, 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 uh, labor of uh, innova innova innovation if they haven't really proven themselves uh, at least done this service or done this product somewhere else with a clear validation. And so one of the key documents you have to submit in the, in the tendering process is um, proof of good completion of good service rendered somewhere else so that we can actually be confident that whatever we are procuring, you're able to do it uh, on time that is agreed. Um, uh, we've also the, 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 the least uh, money we can spend to acquire uh, the best quality product that we need. So it's very risk averse. We're not going to take a chance to a startup that is just trying to prove uh, a model on their product or their service. So that's the traditional way. So the, the new way uh, that introduces public procurement for innovation creates that window of opportunity where we can uh, actually, instead of defining the, those, those very confined term rooms of reference, we can actually open up and do a contest. You can say, uh, government, government entity X, we need product Y. And we want to find the best quality product option. And we want to pay, you know, uh, a reasonable amount of money uh, as much as possible so we can justify the value uh, of the money that we are spending from the public funds. So from that contest, you're able to actually get proposals, but also more, most importantly, prototypes. In this case, you're not really fully defining what, what, you, what you're looking for, but you're allowing, you're leaving room for probably good surprises where you may actually get one of the most innovative, newest um, a product that you didn't even know that startups may come up with because you've created the demand. So this is really what we're excited about because in the last couple of years, you know, piloting around uh, public procurement for innovation, especially when it comes to services digitization, we're seeing a lot of excitement from the startups. Um, one of the recent uh, use cases we, we tried is um, uh, a service with the Ministry of Health. Uh, typically, uh, they, they have a lot of demand for licens licensing new health uh, facilities, could be clinics, could be hospitals, could be um, other type of health uh, service providers. And the amount of paperwork that you have to submit manually and the time it takes officers to go through validating your personnel or the requirements in terms of facilities, equipment, it's essentially very cumbersome. So we, we worked closely with the Ministry of Health uh, through a program that is supported by uh, JICA, uh, through the Japanese Corporation uh, Agency in Rwanda, we work with on this particular uh, use case. And we're able to, one, allocate some funding um, to, to support, you know, MOH and the Ministry of Health, and to bring on board a, a startup that could then digitize the whole process where people don't have to submit, you know, uh, large binders of paperwork uh, and can really get this service seamlessly. So what we did was a contest. We were able to uh, to go through a process of reviewing the prototypes that they provided, and we awarded uh, this to a local company called Orion to digitize the service. And it took us less than three months for the services to be online. Now, actually, it's it's live. It's being used. And the interesting part in it is that it would have costed a lot more money, close to 10x had we taken the traditional way of um, a digitizing this service. And so because we took that innovative approach, we were able to one, find a local company that is able to do it fast and affordably. And we also create the relationship between the company and the ministry where they continue to work together in fine tuning the product. Because most of the time you acquire product is not necessarily 100% responding to your needs. 
But now there is that relationship between the, 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 the local company and the ministry to continue to fine tune and maybe add more modules to, to, to the system. And that's what we mean by public procurement for innovation is that you are willing to bring in uh, a young solution, a young startup, and instead of that kind of vendor um, uh, vendor buyer relationship, you create a partnership. And five years later, this solution will probably be ready to uh, to be exported and scale in other countries where they may need the same service. But you invest as government in this particular case, the Ministry of Health in really creating that use case, onboarding that startup, working hand in hand to make sure that you get the best solution that serves your needs. And our goal um, uh, as a Minister of ICT Innovation is even then to, to start thinking about if this can work and serve the purpose in Rwanda, every government will have facilities they need to register and manage. And so how can we then export this solution? So that's what the opportunity is with a public procurement for, for innovation. Not only are creating opportunities for these same startups we're supporting and nurturing them, but we're also making sure that they can they can access the market, both for local market, but also for the potential to export. That sounds like a fantastic idea, but then I'm curious to, um, to me, it sounds like a very obvious thing to do, right? However, I'm just wondering from you guys and how you, you know, when you're coming up with this idea or this concept, uh, what, what makes you believe that this is the right moment, that the market is ripe for something like this? It wasn't maybe ready 10 years ago, but it is ripe right now to be able to launch such a project. That's a very interesting question. I think we are in the right moment to be really, you know, doubling down in supporting uh, startups to access um, market, particularly government tenants, because when you look at what has happened in the last about five to seven years, um, the education ecosystem is graduating people that are, that are competent, but also because of the market structure, you have many young people that are interested in actually solving the solution, the, the, the challenges by providing their own solutions. Um, Typically, we, we were looking outside, you know, kind of importing solutions. But I think there is this kind of drive on homegrown kind of solutions, uh, homegrown initiative that I think inspired our young people to think about what can I do about it. And that's the kind of attitude that really excites me to see um, young people that are really looking and, and working hard, hand in hand, seeking support where possible to say, what can we do about these challenges we're faced with? So I think it starts with both uh, that kind of national desire uh, and inspiration to create homegrown solutions, to tackle our own challenges, even think about how can we then provide solutions that are you know globally competitive and, and scalable. Uh, so I think that's one of, one of the things that I would point out as different and that makes it the time now, uh, the right time to, to support our young startups. The second thing I would say um, we have robust, you know, uh, infrastructure from a technology point of view uh, that is able to support, especially those that are innovating, leveraging technologies. And so your connectivity, the, the hosting services, uh, many different things that you need, um, affordability of the services, and also uh, consistency of the services has increased over time. Um, and also I think the digitization journey where, the, the, the increase of smartphone ownership, um, uh, access to connectivity for the general population. These are also making it possible for people to innovate within the digital technologies. Previously, if you are putting a service online, most businesses and individuals would struggle to access it. But today, most of the citizens can access the services uh, at the fingertip of, 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 um, uh, of their convenience. So through a smartphone. So I think it's, 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 it's a quite a different time that I think we've been able to create this um, uh, opportunity. Um, and the, the last thing, the third thing I would say, we've also been deliberate as a country over the last 10 years to create innovation hubs. Uh, I think when you look at um, uh, previously what is known as uh, K-Lab and, and Fab Lab, it was uh, only here available in Kigali. But in the last 
five years, we have, you know, hubs uh, in secondary cities, about seven hubs now uh, established. What does that mean? It means that across the country, the young people can access uh, spaces and programs and tools and coaches and mentors and incubation uh, programs that are helping them to actually take that process. So it's beyond just being inspired uh, and having the skills. It's actually then being handholded through that process of uh, venture creation and, and building it and, and eventually accessing the market. So I think um, these are programs that we we see uh, and making it possible for us to now be able to leverage the the innovation that is happening. System. Exciting times indeed. Um, going back to the question about, uh, you know, who is eligible to be able to apply for some of these tenders. I think, you know, we talked a little bit about this, that one of the biggest struggles is we don't feel us as founders, we don't feel like we are eligible for a lot of these projects because of just the nature of them. Um, and then I'm just trying to understand from this pilot project that you guys have been able to run with a startup, a local startup, um, what do you think made them eligible to for, for such a project, right? Uh, so that, you know, whoever is listening can say, okay, great, uh, maybe these are the basic requirements uh, that I need to have to even, you know, be considered uh, to work on some of the, uh, you know, some of these tenders. Right, right. So as I mentioned, we do a contest, right? So in this case, we get proposals from... Um, Actually, interestingly enough, there's a lot of appetite and interest when you highlight this. And we had about 80 people competing. Uh, we, when we were launching this contest for one single solution, you have about 80 startups that are actually submitting proposals. So there is a very high yeah, interest and appetite for startups to provide solution. But in terms of what I think makes you very competitive as a startup, one, you have to immerse yourself in understanding what is it the challenge you're trying to solve? What, what is the pain point of this organization? Because we're deviating from the old ways of the organization, actually, in some cases, hiring a consultant and doing a comprehensive study on the solution that they need and then giving you, this is what we need. This is how we want it. This is how much time you need to deliver it. And that's it. Those things previously are fixed. Now, you actually now that responsibility comes to you. It's not outsourced to one, anyone else. It's being outsourced to you to say, okay, organization X, this is your challenge. Now let me think about the perfect solution, the best solution um, that is affordable, that is timely, that is agile, that, that can grow even with your needs. So those are the different parameters you're looking at. So number one, you have to have that deep understanding uh, of, of the challenge and also then have clarity on how you're going to solve it. That's number one. Number two, you have to be able to ask the right questions. You have to invest the time to um, engage the user department, to look at all the beneficiaries, and map out a comprehensive solution. Now, you may not propose uh, to begin with a fully uh, fledged uh, a solution. You may design a roadmap on how you may get there. But depending on how you may have understood their challenge, you may start with feature one and create a trajectory on how you get to the, to the full solution that they may need. So that means that you have to fully understand the operations, the, the processes that this organization is, 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 has. Number two, you have to assemble a team that has the most competencies. Uh, so you, you, again, here you're not presenting a ready to buy solution, but you need to be able to come up with a team that is going to help you now, you know, implement the solution that is being looked for. Right. Uh, and that's one of the things that, uh, we look for. We look at the team composition. Have you really been able to put together the best team, uh, to work with us on the procuring, uh, uh, agency? Do we feel confident that the team is, is capable to really deliver on the solution? Uh, number three, you have to uh, think about the financial model about this. Most of these services, we are not necessarily saying we're going to acquire, you know, where you price it, it's going to cost $1 million, and that's the funds we're going to pay you. It may cost $1 million, but you need to then come up with a financial model that allows the government 
the agility to acquire the solution without necessarily having to pay upfront. So which means that in, in, in their scalability or, or, or uh, design process, you may actually start generating revenue as you offer certain services. Um, some services offer that, that flexibility where, you know, there is a fee paid. And so this fee can then kind of generate uh, the revenue that is now invested in further development. So when you think about the model uh, of how you, you provide the solution, you need to think about the financing as well so that you offer government in this particular case the most flexibility on how uh, the cash flow going to financing the solution will go. Uh, one of the biggest constraints that may limit governments to digitize fast enough is that you always have to come out with the budget. Then when you're ready, you go and acquire the solution. Public procurement for innovation comes in to mitigate that challenge where you may actually not have the totality of the funds you need to acquire a solution. And so that's where uh, it's important for uh, the, the company or the startup proposing a solution to really think about the financing model um, and, all, and then so to allow is acquisition. Um, those are key uh, elements, but I would say, you know, uh, just the commitment to be willing to, to, to work that journey, um, uh, but also to focus on, on higher standards when it comes to the kind of solutions you're going to provide to, to the government. So what I'm learning from you is that um, when it comes to the, you know, being eligible for some of these projects uh, or these tenders is that you're not limiting, you know, the startup, right? Previously, it was like you have to be, have 10 years of experience, 45 people on your team will have PhDs and masters and stuff. And uh, for, for this new project, you guys are now looking at, um, you know, uh, are you a technology company? Can you actually, do you have the capacity in-house uh, to offer this? Uh, and that's very interesting. I think it opens a lot of doors for founders to really, uh, you know, put themselves out there. It's very open. And, yeah. and, on, and again, you're going to be judged on also your ability to quickly put together a prototype. Because yeah. it's a contest where you're not just submitting paperwork, someone at the end, at the other end, reviews it and send it back to you. No, you're actually coming up with a demo and a prototype. And so the last stages of uh, evaluation, you have to demonstrate it. And so that, again, speaks and it helps us to evaluate the, the, the clarity and the thinking, the competencies that you have to really work the journey with us. What I'm trying to understand here is who takes the money? Right. Is the government my client? Uh, do I fully own the product? Is the government an investor? Uh, can I take the same product and go and sell it to another country or another, uh, you know, uh, institution? Uh, so can you take me through a little bit about, uh, you know, when it comes to the investment side of things uh, or the ownership as well? So the example in the pilot that I that I gave is actually under a project uh, called the Rwanda uh, Digital Innovation Promotion Project, um, and we have a number of principles in, in selecting use cases that we are bringing to innovators. Number one, it has to obviously you know solve a, a problem that that is very specific that has been presented by a government uh, entity. So in the use case I discussed, we had a challenge presented by the Minister of Health. It was very specific, and so we, we started the journey by identifying and confirming that this is indeed a, a challenge we're going to do. So once we, once we do that, we, uh, through the project, we're able to allocate some seed funding. Because when you come on board, we're not requiring that you come up, yes, with the business model, but also we, we're not supporting you. We actually have the ability to support financially. But the point is here, we, we may or may not fund entirely the cost that, that it takes to develop it, which is where then the, 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 the business model comes in, the financial model comes in. Um, we discourage a direct acquisition where, because that would then be the traditional tendering where you have to have a budget, you, you send out, the, you, you submit the bids, and then you evaluate the most, uh, uh, I guess, accurate solution but with the least uh, budget, right? Yeah. In this case, you're, you, you're looking beyond that. You're looking at, okay, this might be more expensive, but I'll pay it in 20 years through revenue generated under the project versus I would have to now stop everything, wait to find the totality of the money, and then be able to acquire the solution, which 
might be also be delayed you another year or two to mobilize the budget. But in this particular case, you, you may actually start day one with the solution that you continue to develop. Uh, and so that initial investment, we are able to uh, figure out the requirements and provide it. Now to the second part of your question, as, as, an, as an innovator creating this solution, what's the incentive to actually offer that kind of flexible financial model? It's, it's what we are piloting uh, to say, actually, we're giving you a platform to have a proof of concept. And then you know Rwanda has a proof of concept strategy, uh, which is through that same framework that companies like Zipline were able to come find a conducive environment, find the first use case with the government of Rwanda, and now grow and scale globally. So we're saying to you as a, as a founder, as a startup, we're saying what you benefit is not only initial support in terms of use case funding to develop this, but it's also the scalability. Uh, the particular solution in, in health, you know, can be applicable to almost any country globally. Uh, and now, some countries may be already advanced, maybe have similar solution in place, but when we're looking at selecting the use case, we wanted to see what is the likelihood that there may be, you know, five to 10 countries out there that may use the same service. So what I'm excited about, you know, over the next year or two is to see, can we, together with our partners, uh, can we be able to present this company to these countries where they can be able to take the solution? And actually, the revenue they may make in those other instances might be much bigger, much higher than what they would have, what they have made or they would have made if we're just only looking at providing a service to the government of Rwanda. So that's the end goal is to, yes, give access to the market, to the startup in Rwanda and support them. But their success really becomes the beginning. It's a proof of concept that they can then take to other contexts. So there are different models you can go about it. And then there's the beauty of like actually, you know, this innovation process, whereas the ministry were willing to test. And so uh, to your question, the public program for innovation provides for these flexible ways of engaging with startups, which we didn't have previously. Right, because in that process, should a company require much more investment to be able to design a robust and scalable solution, we as government then have the opportunity to say we can we can we can enter that discussion, and so I think it allows us possibility. It may not always be the case where government necessarily invests in it. Ultimately, we are looking at uh, supporting our own startups to have this global competitiveness that can. Uh, actually, in the end, generate more jobs for us, which is a benefit from government, uh, from the country. It may generate, actually, um, forex coming in if you're providing these services in the countries. So there are many, many ways we can also evaluate the benefit from a government point of view that may not be necessarily having equity in, in the company, uh, even though um, given the flexibility of the model, that could be a possibility. So you've piloted this and it's been successful so far. So what's the next step? Um, a lot of people are listening right now and they wonder, uh, you know, can we see more? Are we going to see more tenders coming out? Uh, and uh, yeah, basically, what is your next step after this successful pilot? Oh, fantastic. So I think we're very excited. We're very excited that um, we're seeing the, the early successes. We're seeing interest, as I mentioned, you know, uh, on average, about 80 companies have bid it on on um, uh, on the, the 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 use cases we've implemented. So it, it tells us that the demand is there, the need is there. Um, we also know that we have so many other services to digitize. Rwanda, in particular, we wanted we want you know a national strategy for transformation one to be at 100% service digitization of, uh, for the citizens. So we we are still not there but we feel public programming for innovation among other strategies and projects we are doing is an opportunity to double down on fast tracking at this process of digitization. So what I could say to those who are listening, especially uh, startups and founders that are in this area of digitization is that really uh, keep an eye uh, open to our platform. We have a platform called innovaterwanda.rw. This is where we post uh, these opportunities where we, we're going to be doing as a ministry and, and our partners, especially with our implementing agency, RISA, is to bring out more use cases. And we have 
funding to support uh, kickstarting this this process of innovation. So there will be several other use cases over the next couple of months uh, being launched, and we invite uh, startups to to, uh, to to apply, come uh, really join us in in digitizing uh, different services. Yeah. I know you're working with a couple of partners uh, to implement some of these projects. Uh, can you tell me who are these partners and what is their involvement in this? On a public program for innovation in particular, uh, JICA has been um, a key partner in this phase of the pilot. As I mentioned, uh, the Ministry of ICT had a pilot uh, about 2021, uh, but this second, second phase of different pilot of use cases, we're partnering with JICA uh, through the Rwanda uh, digital innovation promotion project, and um, we will be having about five use cases uh, launched in the next couple of months. Uh, but we are scaling um, the pilot, uh, partnering with GIZ um, and many other partners that are coming on board, either to support financially or to provide um, business services support uh, to those startups that will be participating. So the government of Rwanda is really looking forward to enabling our innovation ecosystem more by creating these um, uh, opportunities to access uh, public uh, tendering um, and, 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 and being able to um, advance in, in meeting our priorities, um, especially coming from the Ministry of ICT Innovation. Uh, we have um, uh, uh, a scope that is quite uh, cross-cutting. So... We want to look at companies that can leverage the emerging technologies. We're we looking at AI use cases in particular uh, to make sure that the solution we're providing to different sectors are those that you know can be sustainable, can scale, uh, but also uh, can be exportable. We want to make sure that we bring uh, the best of Rwanda's ingenuity when it comes to innovation to the rest of the world, uh, starting with the region and then and, and then scaling. So I think. That's the opportunity uh, that we, we, we hope uh, that the public procurement for innovation will have for the startups. We've talked a lot about, you know, the opportunities for local entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs who are in Rwanda trying to build their businesses and scale them outside. But we're also seeing that uh, there's a lot of founders, entrepreneurs and really talented people who are, you know, either on the continent or even outside who are looking for, you know, a space to, to start their companies so they can penetrate the African market. And Rwanda is emerging as, a, as, a, as an exciting destination for them. So I want to understand what are some of the things that, uh, you know, at the Ministry of ICT and Innovation, you guys are thinking about in terms of, uh, you know, attracting some of these uh, founders from other countries to come and set up here and what kind of incentives or, you know, different projects you guys are looking into. So our, our Rwanda's uh, investment code uh, provides for this ability to attract talent because investment, you know, financial investments, you know, cannot go without cap building capabilities. You know, we obviously have certain capabilities uh, in, uh, in terms of Rwandan uh, people, uh, but we also recognize uh, to scale and have even more sophisticated business models and type of operations, we require to have even more diversified talent. And so, the investment court provides for, for that. And it's also in line with our, our, our um, proof of concept uh, strategy to make sure that companies that are wanting to come pilot and test different ideas in, in Rwanda, where they can serve a purpose, but also um, scale uh, back to where they're coming from or other places in the world, we provide uh, a comprehensive um, support uh, ecosystem from policies, from regulation, sandboxes, and, and other 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 support, but specific to talent, which is where you ask, we we are looking at um, uh, and, uh, visas for nomads, um, digital nomads who uh, sometimes are also focused on this digital area, uh, so that we can provide that support to uh, have them come be busy here and and support some of the efforts of the ecosystem, but also be able to comfortably, you know, maintain that kind of global engagement uh, that they may have already. So it's, it's something that we're working on, but it's really aligned with, uh, with our strategies. So coming back to Rwanda, right, and I think you are the perfect person to actually answer this question be um, because 
you've started your journey, um, you know, in various different organizations and institutions. You've been an entrepreneur yourself. Now you are working uh, at the policy level. So you're working on drafting policies uh, that would, you know, uh, develop the, you know, innovation infrastructure, um, you know, in the, in the country. And I would love to hear from you. Um, what would you love to see more in the ecosystem? What would you love to see entrepreneurs working on? What would you love to see, um, you know, innovators building on uh, in the market that might be missing right now? No, thank you. That's a very, very uh, good and challenging question. Um, when I started working in public service, I sort of really missed uh, uh, being out there as an entrepreneur trying to solve these problems. But I quickly realized, actually, the Ministry of Asset Innovation is the best place to be because it can actually be in between, right? You you get to test ideas, you get to engage with the ecosystem, uh, you get to support directly, you know, some of the startup uh, companies you know, through our programs, through the policies that we do. Um, but you also get to take a step back and think about, you know, how do we redesign and rethink about the, an ecosystem that is really enabling our entrepreneurship, our entrepreneurs to thrive and, and compete globally. And so it's really been um, it's great. And so it gives me, I guess, a vantage point to really hope um, we can support those that are trying, but also guide those that are really coming in with the talent, the attitude, and, and, and the commitment to solve our problems and taking uh, uh, an entrepreneurial out it's not always easy. So that's first to recognize that entrepreneurship is not easy. So what I would expect is individuals that are, that have a long-term commitment to this journey of entrepreneurship. Um, innovation uh, is not easy. Entrepreneurship is not easy. And so we hope we can find those um, startups that are committed in the wrong run to solve these problems. That's number one. Number two, uh, we would wish to have sort of a consistent uh, ecosystem in terms of clarity of the kind of investments you want to see, uh, clarity in terms of support that is required, and, the ch and, and it also of the challenges that we have. Because um, if we don't have that, we may be duplicating efforts. We may not be also necessarily investing where uh, we need to pass the bottlenecks. Uh, for the, for the, the startup, so for entrepreneurs, I would say uh, that's that's um, uh, what I would hope we are creating for them. Um, that it's an ecosystem that that recognizes how hard it is for them, uh, but also creates the kind of support that they require, both from a policy perspective and also programming perspectives, to make sure that they can move to the next level. Um, I'm biased towards technology, so I would say what I also expect is that. Companies are building robust uh, understanding of how they can leverage technology. Sometimes we talk about AI as something that is far removed from our day to day, but I think we are seeing uh, cases is where some companies are able to leapfrog by leveraging these emerging technologies. So I'd really, really hope to see more companies leveraging the data analytics capabilities to understand their customers, to, to redesign their service to be more agile and, and, and nimble. And so I think, you know, being, you know, uh, uh, digitally enabled as, as any company, any startup will, in the long run, allow it to scale and, and allow it to be efficient and provide the best value of money through your service and product. So that's my call to uh, entrepreneurs out there. And um, uh, regardless of what sector uh, you may be in, whether you are in trade, uh, whether you are in agriculture, whether you're in education, whether you're in healthcare, I think there are multiple ways technology can can support you. Um, and that's why we're here as a ministry, is to continue to work with uh, the government uh, agencies, but also the private sector, to figure out what are the most innovative uh, solutions and, 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 and mechanisms that can help our entrepreneurs thrive. Eve, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and uh, telling us your story, um, you know, from starting off as a, an employee in a company, uh, being an entrepreneur yourself, now being, you know, at the policy level and uh, the work that you've been able to do in the ecosystem. Uh, we commend you and your team uh, for that. And we're really excited about some of the 
cool projects that are coming up to support entrepreneurship and innovation um, in Rwanda, but also on the continent. And uh, we just can't wait for some of these things to be launched. Well, thank you for having me. And I must say, this has really been uh, an expected uh, podcast series and and you bring some of the best from the ecosystem to really shed the light on opportunities, also tackling the challenges that we have. So I thank you for creating this space um, and, and I hope uh, founders out there feel the support that um, you create through this platform. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate that.